Okay, what I'd like to do now is we've seen how to determine which currency is overvalued, which currency is undervalued, and apply a triangular arbitrage situation. To be very frank, the, the problem that we just did would be way too difficult for you to do in three minutes, okay? Obviously, and maybe if you're like a currency expert, fine. But you know, who's a currency expert anyway? Um, don't answer that question. And uh, don't send me an email either. Okay, but in any case, the point I'm trying to make is it's not everybody's strength. So they realize that. So it has to be calculations that can be done in a norm. I would expect you, though, to understand which currency is overvalued and which currency is undervalued. But to do all of the mechanics, all the steps we just did would be way too, diff too much to do in three minutes. But I will show you in a few moments how they do come at cross rates and how you won't have to do as many calculations. Okay, the next thing that I want to go over is on page 524 in the readings, where it addresses LOS 13C, which you'll see in your prep provider's materials. It says, distinguish between spot and forward rates and calculate what is called the forward premium or the forward discount for a given currency. Now, if you actually look at your screen right now, what I'm doing is I'm showing you the no arbitrage formula for the currency markets. We've seen this earlier when we did forward and futures contracts and we did forward and futures contracts on currencies. And we see that the no arbitrage formula says that the forward or futures price today, which is agreed to today for what? Delivery or exchange some future point in time, domestic currency over foreign currency, the quotation, is equal to the spot exchange rate, domestic over foreign, times what? One plus the different the different interest rates because you're dealing with two different countries two different currencies so two different interest rates and usually those interest rates are, could be risk-free rates but it's going to be the domestic interest rate over the foreign currency's interest rate raised to the time whatever it is a quarter of a year half a year this is the more precise methodology now the premium or discount we can actually derive from this formula now when they show it to you in the curriculum readings initially they just say oh it's forward minus spot well, if you want to calculate, you need to calculate forward premiums or discounts in terms of a percentage. So what we do here is we're going to manipulate this formula. Now this no arbitrage formula, what is this no arbitrage formula called for the, um, for the currency exchange rate market? We call this covered interest rate parity. Covered interest rate parity because we're going to distinguish later on between covered interest rate parity and uncovered interest rate parity and also cover the uh, foreign exchange carry trade. Now, this no arbitrage formula basically says that if there's any kind of disequilibrium in the marketplace or there's any potential arbitrage opportunity, that arbitrage opportunity can be eliminated because there are futures of forward contracts available to do that. That's why we say that the forward is equal to the spot. This is going to be different from the uncovered interest rate parity, which we'll do in a little while. Now, what I want to do is back up before I walk you through the formula and understand. In this particular reading, ladies and gentlemen, there are discussions about different theories that have been presented to help explain or determine exchange rate changes, different theories. And what are the theories that are mentioned in the readings? You have, for example, uh, the law of one price, absolute purchasing power parity, relative purchasing power parity, you have the international Fisher equation, you have covered interest rate parity, uncovered interest rate parity, you have the ex-ante version of PPP, which is not that important. You have all these different theories, and all of these different theories are almost saying the same thing, and as we'll see in a moment, okay, as we go through this. Now, coming back, uh, coming back so you have these different theories that are used to help or explain or determine exchange rate changes. Some of them are useful, some of them are not too useful. In other words, they're successful or not successful in explaining or determining exchange rate changes. So there's theories. And then later on in the readings, toward the end of the reading, they talk about models that can be used to determine or explain exchange rate changes, like the pure monetary model or the Dornbush model, the uh, Mundell Fleming model, the portfolio approach. All of these are different ways of, or different models that can be used to explain or determine exchange rate changes. So don't confuse the theories like covered interest rate parity with the models like the Mundell Fleming model, which we're gonna get into later. So right now we're focusing on the theories in a moment and then later on we're gonna talk about the different models. So now if I take this exchange rate that I, this formula that you have on your screen and I manipulate it a little bit, because what I wanna do is I wanna get the interest rates alone. I wanna get the interest rates alone. So here's what I do. Mathematically, I'm going to first divide both sides by the spot exchange rate, okay? Forward 
and so I'll have forward over spot is equal to one plus the domestic interest rate over one plus the foreign interest rate raised to the time. You can see that in the second line. And then through a little bit of math, I want to get rid of those ones. And the way that I get rid of those ones, and again, you can, if you want to spend Saturday night doing the math to figure this out, that's fine. I got better things to do with my Saturday night. So I'm not going to do this for you. But basically, if you do through the, you want to wave a wand or something, a little bit of magic math here, you will end up with the formula that's at the bottom of your screen, which is what you need to know. And what you need to know is that the forward exchange rate or the futures exchange rate, domestic over foreign, minus the spot, domestic over foreign, over the spot, domestic over foreign, should be approximately equal to the differences in the interest rates. Stop. Domestic minus foreign. What do I mean by stop here? Let's talk about this. Those interest rates that I have, the domestic interest rate minus the foreign interest rate, are those nominal interest rates or are those real interest rates? They are nominal interest rates. When I have the exchange rate, 100 yen per dollar or 90 yen per dollar, is that a nominal exchange rate or a real exchange rate? That is a nominal exchange rate. Whenever we're looking at interest rates, whenever we're looking at exchange rates, we're looking at nominal exchange rates or nominal interest rates, unless told otherwise. Because what is the difference between nominal and, and real? The difference between nominal and real is the differences in the inflation rates, or the difference between nominal and real is expected inflation. So in other words, what I'm doing here is I'm saying that the forward minus the spot over the spot, which is what we call the forward premium or the forward discount, and I'll explain the difference in a moment, is approximately equal to the differences in the nominal interest rates. And those nominal interest rates include expected inflation. So they include the real interest rate plus expected inflation. So I have nominal interest rates. Never, ever, ever forget that for the level two exam or for the level three. These are nominal interest rates and nominal exchange rates. Okay, so now, what is the whole idea here? We're gonna come back to this formula in a second. We're gonna come back to this formula in a second. If you look at your exchange rate, if you look at your slide right now, there's an, I put up a different screen here for you to look at. I'm showing you what we're doing here so that you can understand this forward premium discount a little bit better. I'm looking at two countries, Japan and the United States. Now, there, before we get into the nominal, the real, and the expected inflation, we need to give some background. What we generally say is that we say that there are two types of markets out there. We have what are called well-integrated markets and we have what are called segmented markets. And you will see this again in level three. What is the difference between well-integrated markets and segmented markets? Well-integrated markets are markets that where capital, they are markets where capital can flow freely across international borders with little or no impediments to trade, such as tariffs, quotas, voluntary export restraints, or the like. So capital can flow freely across international borders with little or no impediments to trade. Examples of well-integrated markets are your well-developed markets or your more developed markets like the US, Japan, the Eurozone, uh, Switzerland, the British pound, the UK, all right, Canada, no, I'm just kidding, Canada, okay? And even you could throw in Mexico, you might disagree with that, but because of NAFTA and still NAFTA is in existence, um, we could say that those are all well integrated markets, that capital can flow freely across international borders with little or no impediments to trade. Don't, let's not dispute Mexico, I'm just saying based on NAFTA, let's use that argument for, for argument's sake. And therefore when the markets are well integrated, real rates should be the same. The real rates should be equalized. You should be earning the real rate, meaning the inflation adjusted rate, the same real rate of return in those countries. So any differences in their nominal exchange rates or their nominal interest rates is due to what? Inflation differentials alone. On the other hand, if markets are segmented, what are segmented markets? Segmented markets are markets where capital cannot flow freely across international borders. There are impediments to trade. There are voluntary export restraints or tariffs or quotas or some other type of barriers to, to, to trade that are going to create a segmented market. Usually your segmented market, examples of segmented market would be your lesser developed markets like maybe China, India, uh, some of the countries in Africa, Latin America. They would have all kinds of barriers to trade or restrictions on trade or control, ca uh, controls on capital. So capital cannot flow freely across international borders. Therefore, any differences in the nominal rates, any differences in the nominal rates can be due to inflation differentials 
and also real rate differences. So we really don't know which part is gonna be real rate differences and which one is gonna be inflation differentials. So we really don't concern ourselves and neither does the readings with the lesser developed markets or the emerging markets of the world when we're focusing on markets. We're focusing more on well integrated markets. So now coming back to this example that you have on your screen here that I showed you with Japan and the US, since Japan and the US are considered well integrated markets because capital can flow freely across international borders with little or no impediments to trade. We see that the real rates are the same. They are 2%, and 2%, they're 2% in Japan and the United States. However, the nominal rates are different. In Japan, the nominal interest rate is 3%, and in the US, it's 5%. And that is due to the inflation differentials of 1% in Japan and 3% in the United States. So we see that real rates are the same, and any differences in the nominal rates are due to inflation differentials alone. Okay. Now, how can we utilize this? Again, the nominal rate includes inflation, as you can see. So what can we infer from this, or what can we learn from this? What we see is that there's a difference of 2% in the inflation rates, the expected inflation, and there's a 2% difference in the nominal rates, and real rates are the same. So here's how we could look at it. We're expecting, based on inflation differentials, only inflation differentials, that the Japanese yen will appreciate by 2%, and the US dollar would depreciate by approximately 2%. Why? Because the country with the higher inflation rate should, has less purchasing power, it is more subject to purchasing power risk, it has more purchasing power risk, it has less purchasing power, so countries whose cur who have higher inflation rates should see their currency depreciate, and countries with lower inflation rates should see their currency appreciate. So let's take a look at three scenarios based on the Japan USA example that you have on your screen. Scenario number one, we are expecting based on inflation differentials alone that the Japanese yen which is the foreign currency is going to depreciate and we're always focusing on the currency that's in the denominator of the quote. I can't say this enough. Focus on the base currency, the currency that's in the denominator of the quote, because everything is being quoted per unit of that currency. That's going to get you the question, the, question, the, the answer is correct on the exam. Foc not knowing what to focus on is going to get you to guess or the wrong answer. So we're focusing domestic over foreign, we're focusing on the foreign currency, what's in the base. So since Japan, we're going to assume there were Americans here and Jap the Japanese yen is the foreign currency, the Japanese yen is expected to appreciate by 2% and the US dollar is supposed to depreciate by 2%. But we're gonna focus on it from the Japanese perspective where the Japanese is, yen is expected to appreciate by 2%, the differentials in the inflation rates. Now, scenario number one, what happens if a year from now, the Japanese yen appreciates exactly by 2%? Okay, it goes from 100 yen to 102 yen. It appreciates by exactly I'm sorry, that, that would be incorrect. If the Japanese yen appreciated by 2%, it would go from 100 yen, um, one dollar equals 100 yen, and then now uh, by 2%, it changed by, by 2%, whatever the calculation is, 90, whatever you do. If the Japanese yen, the point here is, if the Japanese yen actually appreciated by 2%, and all of it could be explained by inflation differentials alone, which is 2%, then we would say, well, the inflation differentials are 2%, the Japanese yen appreciated by 2% on a nominal basis, so on a real basis, it didn't change. All of it could be explained by inflation differentials alone. There was no real exchange rate change between the Japanese yen and the US dollar. 